Hello, and welcome back to the Comprehensive American President's Iceberg, a 15-tier iceberg that covers fun facts, controversies, conspiracies, and everything in between all about the presidents. This is part two, and we're covering tiers six through 10. And if you wanna watch the first part where we cover tiers one through five, it's linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it with tier six. Did you know there's a statue of Bill Clinton in Kosovo? Let's talk about why it's there. The 11 foot tall Bill Clinton statue is on Bill Clinton Boulevard in Pristina, Kosovo. So why does this random European nation have such an affinity for the 42nd president? Well, Kosovo had a hard time fighting for independence and Bill Clinton helped them achieve this. You see, when Kosovo broke away from Serbia, a war broke out. President Clinton stepped in and ordered NATO bombing strikes against Serbia. Soon after this, the war ended and Kosovo became independent. To show their gratitude, a statue was made in his honor. The largest denomination of American money is the $100 bill, but this hasn't always been the case, and this is our first example of a bigger bill. The $500 bill has been minted a few times, and it features President William McKinley on it for some reason. Yeah, there's no real reason for him being on it. The bills were last minted in 1945, and if you get one, they're worth a lot more than their face value. Could the White House be haunted? Well, President Harry Truman thought it was. Truman lived alone in the White House for some time, but he was never really truly alone. At night, he would report the ghosts of Andrew Jackson stomping and cursing and arguing with the ghost of Teddy Roosevelt. But the most commonly reported ghost is that of Abraham Lincoln. Harry Truman was once spending the night in Lincoln's old bedroom before he was awoken by a knocking at the door. He opened it and there stood Abraham Lincoln. Other prominent figures, including Eleanor and Theodore Roosevelt, Grace Coolidge, and the most interesting example, Winston Churchill, all reported sightings of the former president. Winston, while staying in the White House, once stepped out of the bathtub naked with a cigar. He walked into an adjacent bedroom where he saw the ghostly leader, to which he said to him, Good evening, Mr. President. You seem to have me at a disadvantage. Lincoln then smiled before fading away. This sounds like a kick-ass sitcom, Haunted White House, starring Chris Pratt and no one else. When George Washington became president, he ran completely unopposed. In his second term, he also ran unopposed, but a man named George Clinton ran for vice president and he almost beat John Adams, but Adams won in the end. There was only one other election that had a candidate run unopposed, and it was in 1820 when James Monroe ran without an opponent. I'm sure every United States president indirectly killed at least one person, whether it's through our wars or various policy changes, but this entry refers to presidents who directly killed people by their own hands. First of all, it would be a shorter list if we were to name presidents who were not soldiers in a war, so we're not going to discuss wartime killings. We mentioned earlier that Andrew Jackson was in several duels and killed many people in them, most famously Charles Dickinson. But a story we haven't mentioned is Grover Cleveland. Before he was the president, he was the sheriff for Erie County, New York. While doing his job, he personally hanged two men. He had the option of hiring someone else to do the executions for him, but he declined, saying it was his responsibility. On March 30th, 1981, a man made the Secret Service earn their pay when he attacked the current president, Ronald Reagan. Reagan was rushed to the hospital and the attacker was arrested. This attacker was John Hinckley Jr. Now Hinckley did have a reason for attacking the president. Did he disagree with him or did Reagan hurt him personally or is there some other semi-reasonable reason? Even better, he did it to impress Jodie Foster. And would you believe me if I told you it worked? John Hinckley was released in 2022 and is very much in the public sphere. He's making these crappy cat paintings that are selling for thousands of dollars because it's the guy who shot Ronald Reagan, aka a national hero. And he's making music. He keeps trying to host concerts, but they keep getting cancelled once the venues find out it's the guy who shot Reagan coming to town. In March of 1990, George H.W. Bush began his downfall by sharing his opinion, and his opinion was that broccoli was disgusting, one I agree with. I'll read his words. 
I do not like broccoli, and I haven't liked it since I was a little kid and my mother made me eat it. And now I'm president of the United States, and I'm not going to eat any more broccoli. This upset Americans, as broccoli was kind of a symbol at the time. It was at an all-time high, I'm not making this up. It was deemed the vegetable of the 80s, and it upset Californians, who were responsible for growing 90% of America's broccoli. So the state pledged to send truckloads of the vegetables right to the White House. Bush wasn't backing down. He continued his crusade against the vegetable by banning it on Air Force One. However, Americans continued to love this vegetable. Consumption doubled across the states, and Bush's political opponents took advantage of this. The wives of Bill Clinton and Al Gore, Hillary and Tipper, began to advertise broccoli in their campaigns, pledging they would put broccoli back in the White House. And this must have worked, because he lost. Finally, when H.W. passed away in 2018, his son mentioned his disdain of the vegetable as a part of his eulogy. To us, he was close to perfect, but not totally perfect. His short game was lousy. <laughs> he wasn't exactly Fred Astaire on the dance floor. The man couldn't stomach vegetables, especially broccoli. On December 14th, 1799, after a long and drawn out period, George Washington passed away. And we're going to get into exactly how long and drawn out it was. George had came in that day from a storm and he was soaking wet. For some reason, he stayed in his soaking wet clothes through all of dinner and he developed a sore throat through the night. His doctor was fetched and he began his torture, I mean treatment, of Washington's disorder. He began by giving him a mixture of sugar, butter, and vinegar to soothe his throat, but this instead almost choked him to death. And then he began bloodletting Washington. If you're unfamiliar with bloodletting, it's basically where you make a cut in someone and you take out their bad blood in quotes. This basically happened between every treatment option, and I'm not going to mention it every time. Just know it's happening. And in total, nearly three liters, or 40% of his blood, was taken out. Washington also had blisters induced onto him in an attempt to draw out the poison in his body, but instead, this just weakened his immune system. Finally, after nine hours of this, Washington passed away. And the real kicker? Washington died of epigalitis, which is a fancy way of saying a sore throat. Are you a fan of tomatoes, french fries, mac and cheese, or ice cream? If so, you can thank Thomas Jefferson, as the president made them insanely popular. First of all, tomatoes. Thomas Jefferson grew several strange crops at the time, and he was one of the first to popularize tomatoes. At the time, people thought they were poisonous. During a dinner party, Jefferson stood up and bit into one, and people thought he just publicly committed suicide. Next, french fries. When Jefferson left France, he brought several recipes home with them, and one of these recipes was pommes de terre frites accru in petites trunches, which is butchered, and it's French for deep fried potatoes cut into small pieces. Also while in France, Jefferson had ice cream, and he brought this back home, and began to serve it at all dinner parties, making it popular across the nation. Finally, mac and cheese, and I left this one at the end for an important reason. This is another recipe Jefferson ate in France, and it was brought back with him into America. But mentioning Jefferson's popularization of these foods without mentioning James Hemings would be criminal, and it wouldn't be telling the story in a correct manner. James Hemings was a slave owned by Jefferson, and was brought to France of him so that he could learn to cook. It was here that James learned the recipe for macaroni and cheese, a dish that Jefferson loved and wanted to take back into America. Once back into America, Jefferson hosted all of these dinner parties, yes, introducing these foods into America, but he wasn't the one making them. That was James Hemings. So next time you enjoy mac and cheese or french fries or ice cream, thank James, not Jefferson. In 1952, a Canadian reactor began to melt down, and the facility's basement was soon flooded with radioactive water. A crew was immediately gathered to fix the reactor, and they were lowered into the site for 90 seconds apiece, where repairs began. One of these men was Jimmy Carter. Carter was a part of the United States Navy and was a part of the crew on the first ever nuclear submarine. So he had experience working with the technology. The reactor was fixed, but the crew, including Carter, had some side effects. The most notable one was their urine. 
They had radioactive pee for six months after the incident, but no one died, especially no Canadians, thanks to the actions of Carter and his crew. Calvin Coolidge, the 20th president. He had a reputation for being quiet, and he hardly talked. Let's begin with his inauguration. As he was the vice president of Warren Harding, who died before his term was over, so this moved Coolidge to president. He was sleeping when Harding died and was woken up to be sworn in, but after swearing in, he immediately went back to bed. Coolidge then furthered his reputation for being quiet by leaving state dinners early and kind of just napping a lot. At one of these dinners, a man sat to Calvin and told him, I was bet $100 I could get more than two words out of you. Calvin simply replied, you lose. If I had a nickel for every time Jimmy Carter had a major translation mistake, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it is strange it happened twice. In the year of 1977, Jimmy Carter visited the nation of Poland, where he told the people of Poland he was happy to visit the nation. Well, that's what he wanted to say. His translator told the Polish populace he left the United States permanently and was there seeking carnal, carnal relationships, sure. Later in Japan, Carter was giving a speech when he told a joke to a roaring applause. Carter was ecstatic, but also curious as to how his translator delivered the joke so well. When he asked him later, the translator dropped his head in shame, revealing that he told the Japanese citizens, President Carter told a funny joke, everyone needs to laugh. President Biden is the 46th president of America, but he's the 45th unique person to hold the office. This is because of Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland began the presidency in 1884, making him the 22nd. He ran for his second term, but lost to Benjamin Harrison, making him the 23rd president. When Cleveland left the office, his wife told the staff they would be back in four years, and she was right, because Grover Cleveland won the 1892 election, making him the 24th president. Now in 2024, we have Donald Trump running for a second term, and he was the 45th president, lost re-election to Biden, making him the 46th, and now it's possible Trump can win in 2024, making him the 47th. But until then, Grover Cleveland is the only president to serve two terms, not consecutively. For years, probably starting in 2016 or 15, this photo has been circulated quoting Donald Trump as saying, if I were to run, I would run as a Republican. They're the dumbest group of voters in the country. They believe anything on Fox News. I could lie and they would eat it up. People's Magazine. People have taken this quote as gospel, but it's only more recently that people have tried to find evidence of him actually saying it. Now, Trump was on People's Magazine several times, but he never discussed his own politics there. He mostly discussed personal relationships. However, Trump did have a very politically charged discussion about the presidency on Oprah's show, and he says on it he probably wouldn't ever run for president. But that's it. He never discussed parties with her. Trump has discussed his party and has switched it several times, but he never called the Republicans the dumbest voter base. However, I will. You might have messed up, but have you messed up to a point a word was created to describe your mess up? This is President George H.W. Bush, and on January 8, 1992, he was scheduled to visit a banquet hosted by the Prime Minister of Japan, Kichi Miyazawa. President Bush was scheduled to give remarks at the banquet, but things didn't exactly go to plan, as Bush suddenly fell ill and threw up all over the Prime Minister and fainted in his chair. Now, Bush just had food poisoning, so he was fine. The only permanent damage was to his pride, as this event was mocked all through pop culture. It wasn't just America, as he was mocked in Japan so much that a new word was created. Bushusuru, literally meaning to do the bush thing or bushing it. Remember back in Tier 3 when we mentioned Teddy Roosevelt getting shot and almost dying, and I wouldn't tell you why until Tier 6? Well, here we are. What, like two hours later? I don't know. The man who shot Teddy Roosevelt was John Schrank. Shrank claimed that the ghost of William McKinley came to him in his dreams, and he told him to avenge his death. You see, William McKinley was the president before Theodore Roosevelt, and he himself was shot and killed. So Shrank took this dream as gospel, setting out to kill the president.
Here's our first weird White House pet. The animal itself isn't strange, but the story is. In 1827, Andrew Jackson purchased an African Grey pair for his wife for $25, which is an equivalent of $775 today. Anyways, his wife passed away a year later, and Jackson grew attached to the bird, which he named Paul. He taught his parrot how to swear, and when Andrew Jackson passed away in 1845, the parrot swore uncontrollably at the funeral. He wouldn't quiet down, so he had to be removed, and there's no records of the parrot afterwards. Throughout his entire life, JFK had several close calls of death. In fact, by the end of the 1950s, JFK had been read his last rites four times. Being read your last rites is a concept in Catholicism and some branches of Christianity. They're given to people who are about to die and are just meant to be the last prayers of a person. Beginning when he was just two years old, JFK contracted scarlet fever that got so bad, a priest was called in to read his last rites. Just a few days later, he recovered and lived a healthy life, until he was 30 years old. After his World War II service, the now Representative Kennedy was in London when he fell ill and was diagnosed with Addison's disease, an adrenal issue that ran in his family. On his way back home, he was read his last rites as his condition worsened. Then later in life, he was traveling Asia with his brother when his Addison's flared back up and worsened, causing another priest to read his last rites. Now in 1954, he survived. Sorry, what I actually meant to say was, now in 1954, Kennedy underwent back surgery to correct his lifelong problems. During surgery, he contracted a UTI, and it worsened due to his Addison's disease, sparking another last rites reading. So that's four last rites reading, a time he almost died in World War II when we didn't mention it, and a failed assassination attempt, six brushes with death, how much can God hate one man? President Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809, and he died in 1865, and in this time, the fax machine was invented in 1843. Now let's get over to Japan, in which the age of the samurai lasted from 1185 to 1868. So this means there was a 22-year time frame in which a samurai could have sent a fax to Abraham Lincoln. But we can take it a step further. The first modern submarine was made in 1863, giving us a three-year time frame in which a samurai could have sent a fax to Abraham Lincoln from the inside of a submarine. At the 1988 Republican National Convention, George H.W. Bush was accepted as a Republican candidate and he made the following pledge. Read my lips. No new taxes. However, just two years later, George H.W. Bush raised taxes. H.W.'s previous statement was based off the strong economy of the 80s, which he assumed would continue, but we instead entered a recession. The Congress was being led by Democrats, and they proposed a new tax increase to reduce the United States deficit, and H.W. did try to stop it, but he had to reach a compromise. He increased some taxes. You would assume this would destroy H.W., but it really didn't, because the Gulf War was on the horizon, and it pushed the tax rates out of the news headlines, and it pushed H.W.'s approval rating even higher to 89%. A subject of controversy in the early 2000s was that of Barack Obama's birthplace, and people pointed fingers at every corner of the globe. And one set of researchers pointed at Ireland, and they were right. Two researchers named Stephen Neal and Henry Healy began their dig into Obama's ancestry after Healy heard a news reporter mention the name Kearney, and he knew that his Healy side was connected to the Kearney side. And after further research, this is what they found. In a tiny town called Moneygall, the Kearney family were shoemakers by trade. But as the Great Famine began, they joined one of their family members in America. Falmouth Kearney was one of these Irish citizens who left, and when he arrived in the States, he met a woman named Charlotte Holloway. They had children and resettled, eventually landing in Indiana, where their children then had children of their own, and then these children had children. And one of these children was Barack Obama's mom, who then of course had Barack Obama. So if we back up, this means that Barack Obama's great-great-great-grandfather was an Irish-born citizen. 
Obama absolutely embraces his Irish ancestor and even visited Monty Gall in 2011, where Obama met his eighth cousin, Henry Healy, the guy we mentioned earlier. Barack and Michelle visited the president's ancestral home and met other distant family members. Three years later, a Barack Obama Plaza was built and includes statues of the two. If you knew about this, it's probably because of the There's No One As Irish As Barack Obama song, which recounts his story in a musical format, and it's great. Is anyone happy to vote for our two candidates in November? I know we're not, because there's such a common sentiment around the statement, is this the best we can possibly get? And it's not. There's other choices. And one of these other choices has been running for the presidency since 1992. Vernon Supreme, the guy who wears a big boot on his head. He runs on policies such as time travel research, zombie apocalypse awareness, and providing a pony for every American. He also stated that he wants to pass laws enforcing dental care, which lost him the support of British Americans. He's also become famous for throwing glitter on people he disagrees with at debates, and he gained infamy in 2016 when he disrupted one of Hillary Clinton's book signings. He is running for the presidency in 2024, so just know in November, you have options. We discussed presidents on cash earlier, and now we'll discuss why a president is on a coin. FDR is the president on the dime, and he's on there for a good reason. This is because Franklin Roosevelt began the March of Dimes Foundation in an attempt to cure polio, something he himself suffered from. Roosevelt presented the message that it would only take a dime from each person to cure polio, and that everyone, including children, had at least one dime to send in, and maybe even several. The math was included, stating that it only takes 10 people to send in one dime to get a dollar, and if a million people send in one dime apiece, they would have $100,000. At first, the March of Dimes was a failure. In two days, the White House only raised $17.50, but what followed was a flood of biblical proportions. On January 29th, one day before Roosevelt's birthday, 80,000 letters including dimes, quarters, and dollars flooded the White House. After the amount was counted, the United States had raised $268,000. The following day, on Roosevelt's birthday, he went on the air with the following message. It is glorious to have one's birthday associated with a work like this. Roosevelt passed away in 1945, and one year later, in 1946, he was added to the dime and has remained on it since. Before this, the Roman god Mercury was on it, so if you hear the term Mercury dime, that's what it means. I'm gonna be completely honest, I had no idea what the Teapot Dome was. I knew Warren Harding was a part of it, but I had absolutely no idea what it actually entailed. This part was all learning to me. The Teapot Dome scandal took place between 1921 to 23, which was under Warren Harding's terms. This entailed the Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, leasing petroleum reserves at the Teapot Dome oil field in Wyoming to private oil companies. These oil reserves were set aside for emergency use for the United States Navy and were first established by President Taft. However, Fall took a bribe to give these reserves to a private company to later be sold at a higher rate. This was found out, and Fall became the first member of a presidential cabinet to go to jail. This was the biggest presidential scandal pre-Watergate and has been permanently associated with the Harding administration. I didn't know a lot about Robert Oppenheimer pre-movie, but one thing I did know, and really wanted it to be in it, was his and Harry Truman's relationship, and part of it was adapted, but there's even more to the story. After Oppenheimer developed the bomb, and it was used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Truman wanted to meet with the scientist. They did meet on October 25th, 1945, and each of them held different ideas about the bomb. Truman wanted more to be made, but Oppenheimer said he felt like he had blood on his hands. To which Truman said, blood on your hands? He doesn't have half the blood on his hands as I have. He didn't drop that bomb. I did. This was later, but in the moment, Harry Truman did hand him a rag like in the movie and told him that the blood would come out in the wash. He also called Oppenheimer a crybaby scientist and informed his staff, I don't want to see that son of a bitch in my office ever again. We discussed earlier how LBJ would host meetings on the toilet to get what he wanted, but this was only one part of his intimidation tactics he would use while in the White House. Johnson would invade people's personal space, and would bully senators into voting for him through threats, reminders of past favors, and promises of future rewards, and anything else he needed to say to get his way. You saw that picture? Now look at this one. Johnson was a big man. He was 6'4 and 200 pounds, and he used his size to advantage. 
persuading any congressman he needed to get what he wanted. Sarah Sally Hemings was born to Betty Hemings, an enslaved woman owned by Thomas Jefferson's father-in-law. So this means that Thomas's wife and Sally were half-sisters. Another notable person in this is James Hemings, Jefferson's cook we mentioned earlier. He was the brother to Sally Hemings. In 1787, Sally joined Thomas in France where the two likely had an intimate relationship, while Sally was just 14 years old. According to Sally's son, Madison Hemings, Sally told Thomas that she would return to America with him and become a slave again if he promised that their children would be set free, and the future president agreed. It's likely the two had multiple children together, as multiple modern DNA tests have traced back to Sally and Thomas. Smaller branches of scientists have claimed that these tests are wrong, but the community as a whole has pretty much agreed to it. In June of 2018, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello opened an exhibit on Sally Hemings, detailing her life and experience with the president. During the 1948 election, it wasn't a sure thing that Harry Truman was going to win, and the Chicago Daily Newspaper ran a newspaper with the headline, Dewey Defeats Truman. However, Dewey did not defeat Truman. Truman won by a pretty big margin. So the next day, he held the paper up high, laughing about the incident and exclaiming, that's not the way I heard it. During the investigation into Nixon during the Watergate scandal, some strange things were discovered. And perhaps the strangest was an 18 and a half minute long recording of nothing. Richard Nixon basically recorded every conversation he had in the Oval Office. And in the investigation of these recordings, the so-called smoking gun tape was found. This consisted of Richard Nixon audibly ordering the Watergate break-in to be covered up. During the investigation, an 18 and a half minute long recording of silence was found. Nixon's secretary, Rosemary Woods, claimed that she had accidentally recorded over five minutes of this 18, and the rest of it was wiped when she was listening to the re-recorded portion. Not everyone agrees with this story, and some believe that Nixon or Woods wiped this footage on purpose, and some of the conspiracies surrounding the wiped audio get wild. From war deals with the Soviet Union, to deals with terrorists, to a slightly more believable explanation, that it contained more evidence to the Watergate break-in, considering the audio was recorded and wiped three days after the hotel robbery. With all the bad stuff that happened to the Kennedys, people do believe they are cursed, and who could blame them? Joseph Kennedy Jr., John's older brother, was piloting a plane when it suddenly exploded. One of his sisters died when their plane crashed in France. Of course, JFK died in his assassination, and had six close calls of death before this. Then Robert was killed in his assassination. Then later, Ted Kennedy survived the plane crash, but then accidentally drove his car off a bridge five years later, and so much more happened to the entire Kennedy family, causing people to believe they have some kind of bad luck curse on them. And do I think this? No. Here's why. Every family has bad stuff happen to them. Now, I was going to write out some nerd explanation about statistics, but never mind. Yes, the Kennedy family is cursed. In 2002, George Bush was almost assassinated. Was his would-be assassin disillusioned with the president's actions, or were they just crazy? No, they were just stupid. Because the guy who almost killed George Bush was George Bush. On January 13th, 2002, George Bush was in his bedroom at the White House watching a football game. He was eating a pretzel, and he began to choke on it. It got so bad that he fainted and hit the ground. Bush got it free and was able to walk himself through the doctors, and all results came back positively. What a shame. Speaking of presidents almost choking to death, Gerald Ford did it to himself, and lost the election because of it. While on the campaign trail for re-election, the president was in San Antonio, Texas when he was offered a tamale. Now I've never had a tamale, but from what I understand, they are wrapped in a corn husk and you have to take that off before eating it. Gerald Ford did not do this. He bit right into it and got choked on it, embarrassing himself in the entire South. For the entire weekend, every station in Texas broadcasted the story that Gerald Ford did not know how to eat a tamale. He lost the state of Texas, and many people believe this is because of the tamale incident. If he won Texas, he still would have lost by five electoral votes. But like we said, he lost the entire South, and tamales are a dish across them. It's very possible this influenced the entire election. 
This is probably the strangest pet to call the White House home. John Quincy Adams Gator. Marquis de Lafayette, yes, the same one from Hamilton, was originally gifted the alligator when he was touring the states in 1824. And when he made it to the White House, he showed it off to President Quincy Adams, who absolutely fell in love with it. Lafayette let Adams keep it, and he kept it in a bathtub, to which he would use it to scare people when they visited the White House. President William McKinley was superstitious, and he believed in luck. Once, he was given a red carnation from his friend and political rival, L.L. Lambrum. The two ran against each other, and McKinley won, attributing it to his carnation. He became absolutely obsessed with the flower, as he grew them in the Oval Office, gave them out to his friends and voters, and never took off his personal one. This was until a meet and greet was taking place in Buffalo, New York. A young girl asked him for his personal carnation, so McKinley gave it to her. A few handshakes later, and McKinley was shot and killed. We can end Tier 7 with a pretty simple story. The painting of George Washington on the $1 bill was unfinished. This portrait was made by Gilbert Stewart and was commissioned by Martha Washington. However, Gilbert loved his work so much that he decided to keep it, and he began to sell copies. This picture became so famous that it eventually served as the basis for Washington's portrait on the $1 bill. Hey, remember Millard Fillmore, the guy we mentioned in Tier 2 for being so obscure? Here he is again. What, like two hours later? In like the middle of the iceberg. If you know who Millard Fillmore is, and you aren't really in the political scene, you probably know because of his likeness of a well-known actor, Alec Baldwin. Take a look, they're pretty close. But they can't be the same person, because Millard never shot and killed anybody. James Garfield was the second president to be assassinated, and his assassin had a weird reason for targeting him. The man who shot James Garfield was Charles Gateau, and he was a supporter of Garfield. In fact, he even tried to join his campaign. He wrote a speech highlighting Garfield and distributed it, but it was widely ignored. However, when James barely won the presidency, Charles thought he was solely responsible, now hoping to get a spot in the president's cabinet. He did not get a spot in the cabinet, and was now spending his days loitering around DC, plotting revenge. Charles' family noticed this, and tried to have him institutionalized for insanity, but he escaped in 1875. He was now manic, and was really seeking revenge. He purchased a pistol, and waited. It was revealed in the papers that Garfield was going on vacation, so Charles waited for him at the train stop, and once he got there, he shot Garfield. He was apprehended, and he was asked why he did this, to which he said, I want Charles Arthur as the president, sparking a conspiracy that Arthur put him up to it, which he didn't. The man was just insane. The pistol that Charles used was stored in the Smithsonian, but has since been lost. As for James Garfield, he didn't die right there on the spot from being shot. He instead was tortured to death in an attempt to save him, but we'll get into that later, I think. On August 28, 2014, Barack Obama had the biggest controversy of his presidency. Did he start a new war, or downplay a sickness, or call someone fat? Nope. He wore a tan-colored suit. Obama was holding a live conference about the presence of ISIS in Syria and the escalation of American involvement. During this conference, he was wearing a tan suit, which he was mocked for, mostly on conservative networks, as they felt like the suit was unprofessional and offensive to a lot of people to have such a non-serious outfit on for such a serious topic. Representative Peter King said there's no way, I don't think, any of us can excuse what the president did today. I mean, you have the whole world watching. They make it sound like he ate a baby live on stage. He wore a tan suit. Obama had no regrets about his choice of attire, as many presidents in the past also wore a tan suit. I mean, why would he? It's a tan suit. On the week of Obama's 60th birthday, Biden showed up wearing a tan suit, and people believe this was done on purpose, as it was also close to the anniversary of the incident. Uh, to me, just detracted from the seriousness of the moment, and I thought the suit was a metaphor for his lack of seriousness. Harry Truman wore glasses his entire life, and first got them after a 4th of July celebration. He could hear the fireworks, but he could not make out the shapes of their blasts. Truman's eyesight worsened, and he wanted to join the Missouri National Guard, but he couldn't pass the exam because of his poor eyes. 
So Truman instead memorized the vision chart and recited it, passing the vision screening. The JFK assassination has been shrouded in conspiracy since it happened, and one school of thought I kind of subscribe to is the fact that LBJ might have killed Kennedy. LBJ was Kennedy's vice president, but this is not the position he wanted. He wanted to be the president, and he's wanted it for his entire life. He served in Congress for 36 years and then ran for the presidency in 1960, to which he lost the Democratic nomination to John Kennedy. And by all regards, he was a newcomer to Washington, and Lyndon was a lifelong politician. After the two won the presidency, and re-election campaigns began to creep up, the topic of Texas was discussed. Kennedy barely won the state, and he was losing ground there, so it was a big place to campaign in. This was also Lyndon Johnson's home state. So the both of them went on the campaign trail. This is where it gets weird. A woman named Madeline Brown was a lifelong mistress of LBJ, and she claimed that LBJ told her the night before Kennedy died that, after tomorrow, those Kennedy brothers will never make a fool of me again. She also stated that she saw Lee Harvey Oswald, the guy who shot Kennedy, and Jack Ruby, the guy who shot Oswald, the day before Kennedy was killed, standing in a bar, talking about something. These claims have been challenged, of course, and honestly, there's a lot more to this story, and it's a major piece. I'm very interested in it, and I want to dive further, maybe in a video of its own. If that's something you're interested in, let me know. This is the meal Richard Nixon ate on his last day of office. Yes, that is slices of pineapple with cottage cheese on top, all with a glass of milk to wash it down. This is hardly the only weird food choice Nixon liked. He often stated that his favorite food was a mixture of cottage cheese and ketchup, which he ate for breakfast. This is the real reason he should have been impeached. Will America ever have a female president? Well, we kinda already did. This is Woodrow Wilson, who is most certainly not a female, but his wife was. During Wilson's second term, he had a massive stroke that almost killed him. Wilson was paralyzed and running the country from his bedside. He refused to resign, but he was not in any state to carry out executive duties. But Edith Wilson was. She read every paper sent in from every senator and made decisions based on her own judgment, effectively making her the president for the remainder of Wilson's second term. On one instance, Calvin Coolidge pressed the panic alarm he had at the Resolute desk and his Secret Service agents burst into the room, only to see that the president was gone. They then began to panic, and they searched up and down the Oval Office for the president, but they couldn't find him. That was until Calvin appeared. He hid inside the desk and came out, laughing at his prank. This was something he'd do on multiple occasions. Dwight Eisenhower is probably better known as the guy who led the Allied powers through World War II. He was the supreme commander for all Allied forces, so it was his job to be informed of all things Axis powers. However, no amount of knowledge could have prepared him for what he saw as the Allied powers began to liberate concentration camps. The sheer amount of brutality left him speechless, but as he stood there, a thought crept up on him. He wondered if one day, people would deny that any of this happened, and he wanted to prevent that. So, he ordered everything there to be documented. Every single piece of brutality there was photographed and logged, so that one day, Eisenhower could personally testify to its existence. He even invited local German citizens, journalists, and other people there to witness firsthand what the victims of the National Socialists of Germany had to go through. The White House has a basement, and this was added in 1950. It contains areas for storage, an incinerator, an area for carpentry, and most notably, the White House Bowling Lane. This was first added in 1973 for Richard Nixon, who was an avid bowler, but couldn't play as much now that he was the president. The bowling lane was put in, and it's still there and in use to this day. Quentin Roosevelt was the youngest son of President Teddy Roosevelt, and he earns his spot on the iceberg due to his strange death. At the onset of World War I, Quentin joined the United States Air Force, where he would unfortunately lose his life. During the Second Battle of the Marne, Quentin Roosevelt was shot down over France and unfortunately was killed. The German military buried him with full battleground honors and turned his death into a propaganda piece. His gravesite was soon overtaken by the Allied powers, and thousands of American soldiers visited it. 
It was also said that Teddy Roosevelt never fully recovered from the grief experienced by the loss of his son, and he himself would pass away six months later. When Washington became president, he ran completely unopposed. It wasn't until the 1796 election when we had two candidates running against each other for the title. And this is when the long, complicated history of back and forth of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson begins. Actually, let's back up a second. In George Washington's terms, the two worked very closely together because Adams was the vice president and Jefferson was the secretary of state. And even before this, the two were friends and traveled to Europe together. But once 1796 came along and both of them had a shot of the presidency, that's when the gloves came off. In this election, the two dug at each other hard and hurled comments back and forth, and probably the funniest one was when Jefferson's campaign called John Adams his rotundity, calling him fat. Adams won this election, but in 1800, it got even worse. Adams supporters claimed that adultery, incest, and prostitution would be allowed under Jefferson, and Jefferson's crew made fun of Adams for looking like a hermaphrodite. Keep in mind, the two were president and vice president at this time. Anyways, Jefferson won the election, and the two broke apart. Once Jefferson's two terms were over, a man named Benjamin Rush, who helped work on the Declaration of Independence, worked to get the two friends back together. He wrote letters for years, but they fell on deaf ears. What brought them back together was when one of Thomas Jefferson's neighbors visited John Adams and heard him say, I have always loved Jefferson and I still do. Jefferson heard this and wanted to reconvene with Adams. The two then became best friends once again, and it stayed this way for 15 years, before both of them passed away on the same day. July 4th, 1825. John Adams' final words were Thomas Jefferson lives, not knowing he had passed away mere hours before him. Here's a historical butterfly effect for you. A president ignores the letters that later gets over 3 million people killed. The person writing this letter was Ho Chi Minh. The man who ignored this letter was Woodrow Wilson. We're going back to World War I, when Woodrow Wilson was a part of an Allied Forces meeting that was discussing peace terms for the defeated countries. Previously, Wilson had outlined his 14 points declaration, and one of these points called for self-determination of all people. Vietnam at this time was a French colony, so Ho Chi Minh reached out to Wilson to negotiate their independence. Wilson ignored him. But this wasn't the only president to ignore a letter that could have prevented the Vietnam War, because Harry Truman did the same thing. Once again, this was a letter calling for Vietnamese independence, and once again, it fell on deaf ears. The capital of the African nation of Liberia is called Monrovia, and it's named after United States President James Monroe. Let's discuss why. In the 1820s, the number of free African Americans was rising, and an organization called the American Colonization Society came up with a plan to relocate them, along with some other slaves, to a colony in Africa. The ACS purchased some land, and thus the colony of Liberia was formed, and the capital was called Monrovia because of James Monroe, who supported the ACS. As a child, Theodore Roosevelt was thin and sickly, and suffered from asthma. As he got older, he became healthier, and he turned to a life of athletics. One of his favorite sports to participate in was boxing, and he was pretty good at it. He did this through his entire life, in college, and especially in the White House. One person he boxed with on occasion was Colonel Daniel Moore, a military aide and a cousin to Teddy's wife. During a match sometime in 1905, Teddy was hit hard in one of his eyes, and he never fully regained eyesight in it. Roosevelt kept this a secret, and Moore didn't even find out until a decade went by. This did slow Roosevelt down, but not entirely. He continued to box even though he was dealing with poor eyesight, joint pain, muscle tears, and an old age. Do you remember Millard Fillmore? I doubt it, but here he is again, and now we can discuss my favorite story about the president, his final words. Miller died on March 8, 1874 from a massive stroke, and his final words were, this nourishment is palatable. That's basically the 1800s equivalent of saying, this shit's bossing. And he was talking about a bowl of soup he was eating. I like to imagine he face planted into it as he died. Ah, uh, don't you love being called by political candidates running for office? Oh wait, it's, it's not 2005, that doesn't happen anymore. But for a very long time, this is how politicians got their names out there. The very first president to campaign by telephone was William McKinley. In fact, he spent the majority of his campaign at home, calling people with his message.
Thomas Jefferson had a weird relationship with religion, picking and choosing what he wanted to practice in the Bible, or more appropriately, cutting and pasting what he wanted to believe. Because Thomas Jefferson edited the Bible so much to the point it's been published under a new title, The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth, or what is more commonly called the Jefferson Bible. Jefferson made this in an attempt to reduce the Gospels down to their core message. Some things left out of the Bible are any mentions of Jesus' miracle work, his resurrection, and much more. All in all, the Jefferson Bible is only 84 pages long, and the typical Bible is about 3,000 pages long. So only 2.8% of the Bible mattered to Jefferson. Before becoming president, William Henry Harrison fought in the Battle of Tippecanoe against Tecumseh. Harrison won, and Tecumseh was said to curse the leaders of the nation, killing his people, stating that any president born on a year divisible by 20 was to die in office. Seems pretty specific, but Harrison was elected in 1840 and he died in 1841. Same thing with Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, Harding, Roosevelt, and JFK. That's pretty convincing. However, Ronald Reagan and George Bush broke this curse. Reagan was elected in 1840, and he was shot, but he recovered. George Bush was elected in 2000, and he almost choked to death on a pretzel. Now in 2020, Biden was elected, and he's got a year left to break this curse or continue it. George Washington died on December 14, 1799 and dinosaurs were not discovered until 1824, 25 years after he died. A quarter of a century after he died. This makes him the only president to not know about dinosaurs, as the next two presidents to die were John Adams and Thomas Jefferson on the same day in 1826, two years after dinosaurs were discovered. But if we back up, the very first dinosaur bone was discovered in 1677, 55 years before Washington was born. But the scientists of the time thought it belonged to a race of giant humans, not giant lizards. It wasn't until 1824 when the jaw, vertebrae, and leg bone of the Megalosaurus was discovered, when William Buckland pieced this together to a giant lizard. Red Dead Redemption fans, did you know that the Pinkertons were a real organization? The Pinkerton Detective Agency was founded in 1850 by Alan Pinkerton. The group originally specialized in catching train robbers and providing rail security, but they also served as Lincoln's personal bodyguards during the Civil War. They also ran espionage missions against the Confederacy. Lincoln was an unpopular president. I mean, the country split in half because of his election. So the Pinkertons were given this important role of protecting the president. Alan Pinkerton put a woman named Kate Warren in charge of his protection, where she uncovered and foiled a conspiracy to kill Lincoln, the Baltimore plot, something coming up later. So, the Pinkertons may have saved one of the most important presidents, but they also killed John Marston, so it kind of equals out. In George Bush's senior year of high school, he was on his cheerleader team and was actually the head of it. This didn't end here, as he was also a cheerleader while in college. He's not the only president to be a cheerleader, though. Dwight Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, and FDR were all cheerleaders at some point. What do Ulysses Grant and Donald Trump have in common? I'll give you a second. Don't comment your answer because by the time you do, I've already said it. They're the only presidents to be arrested. We're focusing on Grant. And you know what? Let's have another Pawn Stars quiz segment. What was Grant arrested for? That's right. He was arrested for speeding 14 years before the first car was made. In 1872, Ulysses Grant was racing horses outside of the White House on a very populated street and an officer named William West pulled the president over and scolded him for setting a bad example. Grant apologized and said he wouldn't do it again, but this was a lie. He was pulled over the next day for the very same thing. This time, he and six of his friends were arrested. Grant was given a $20 fine, equivalent to $517 today. On June 2, 1924, President Calvin Coolidge signed the Indian Citizen Act, which made all Native Americans birthright citizens of the United States. The act read that all non-citizen Indians born within the territorial limits of the United States be, and they are hereby, declared to be citizens of the United States. 
This gave Native Americans several rights that were not previously accessible, and perhaps the biggest one was the right to vote. Unfortunately, this did not include full voting rights, and it wasn't until 1964 with the Civil Rights Act that full voting rights were given. Back to Coolidge. Three years after this, he was invited to the Lakota tribe. This included a ceremony in which a headdress of eagle feathers was placed on his head, and he was given the honorary title of Leading Eagle. Herbert Hoover gets a lot of hate for his presidency, but I feel his humanitarianism is greatly unappreciated. During the First World War, Hoover was a millionaire living in London from his endeavors as an engineer. But the war soon turned him to a life of public service. In the first few weeks of the war, tens of thousands of American visitors in Europe fled to London for safety, where Hoover, with the help of others, established shelter and food for them. The war ended, but Hoover wasn't done. Now leading the ARA, Hoover began to help a struggling Soviet Union, as the nation was about to enter a famine. In just five years, the ARA was feeding 11 million people in 19,000 kitchens. But the United States didn't like this because, you know, we were feeding communists. But Hoover responded with, 20 million people are starving. Whatever their politics, they shall be fed. But it wasn't just the Soviets. 23 war-torn countries in Europe were fed by the ARA. James Buchanan was the president right before Lincoln, and is often referred to as the worst president we've ever had for a myriad of reasons that aren't important right now. James Buchanan is also known as our only president to never marry, and this entry may explain why, because it's very likely that James Buchanan was our first gay president. This is William R. King, the 13th vice president and maybe the secret lover of James Buchanan. Historians have long dug into the relationship between these two men, and I'll present some of the findings. Let's begin with the fact that these two men lived together in the same house for 10 years. A practice that was not rare at the time, but let's build upon this. William King referred to the relationship as a communion, and they would often go to social events together, sparking comments from several political figures of the time. As the Minister of France, William King would take several trips to Europe, and on one trip away, James Buchanan would write in a letter, I am now solitary and alone, having no companion in the house with me. I have gone a wooing to several gentlemen, but have not succeeded with any one of them. The two even plan to run as president and vice president together, but these plans and ambitions will be cut short, as William King would pass away on April 18th, 1853. James Buchanan would describe him as among the best, the purest, and most consistent public men I have ever known. So what do you think? I personally believe Buchanan was gay or bi or something fruity, because if that's the information we have in the public, who knows what was lost in the years since, but what do you think? And now, we discuss one of my favorite musicians, Johnny Cash. I'm worried though, because if I start talking about Johnny Cash, I'll never want to shut up about Johnny Cash. He's my favorite solo musician, and I'm going to be discussing my favorite Johnny Cash song, Man in Black, his anti-Vietnam War song. While Johnny Cash initially supported Richard Nixon's handling of the war, after he expanded into Cambodia, he quickly changed his mind and would release his Man in Black album a year later. And at the center of this album was the song, Man in Black. The song doesn't only voice concerns about the war, he also voices concerns for the disenfranchised, the so-called poor and beaten down. He spoke about drug users and the people who were being over sentenced and were being kept in prison due to the littlest of charges. But what the song is best well known for is his stance against the Vietnam War. Johnny said he wrote the song for the soldiers who were yearning for home, and the ones who were dying and would never make it home. Overall, he felt our involvement was pointless. Three years after Richard Nixon expanded the war into Cambodia, so two years after the Man in Black album came out, Johnny met with the president, and I love this photo because it looks like he's about to strangle Nixon to death. He doesn't look happy, and it's because he wasn't. Earlier that day, Cash stood in front of a Senate subcommittee and spoke about the nation's problems and advocated for widespread prison reform. Later in the day, Nixon asked Johnny to play at the White House, and he suggested some songs for him to perform, like Okies from Muskogee and Welfare Cadillac. The first one speaks out against protesters, and the second one, Welfare Cadillac, criticizes people on welfare. Johnny Cash then told Nixon, I don't know those songs, but I'll play some of mine. And then he performed several songs that were protesting our efforts in the war. The first song he played was What Is Truth, a song with a very blatant anti-war message in the second verse. The next song he played was the aforementioned Man in Black, and he ended his concert with the Ballad of Ira Hayes, 
a song about the plights of Native Americans, and about the titular Ira Hayes, a Native American veteran who couldn't deal with the guilt of losing his friends during the war and in turn drunk himself to death. Did you know the death of President Abraham Lincoln created the funeral industry? Before Lincoln's death, funerals were much simpler. You'd die, and your family would clean your body up, dress you in nice clothes, and if you were rich enough, a carpenter would make you a coffin, and that was it. During the Civil War, many of the people killed would simply be left there to rot, but the richer families paid to have their families' bodies preserved with this new technique, embalming. Now, embalming wasn't new to the world. The ancient Egyptians had been doing this for thousands of years, but it was becoming a new practice in Europe and North America. So once the Civil War ended, Lincoln gets shot and embalmed, and then after this, his body was paraded across the country. For many Americans, this was the first time they saw a preserved body, inspiring them to do the same thing for their family. Fast forward to today, and most every person who dies is embalmed to have plenty of time for family members to pay their respects. Minnie Cox was the Postmaster General for Indianola, Mississippi under three presidents, Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley, and Teddy Roosevelt. She lost her job under Cleveland, which was between Harrison and McKinley, but got it back once McKinley entered the office. Now, this was a very lucrative position, paying $1,100 a year, which is about $40,000 a year this year. Unfortunately, Minnie was the victim of racial attacks, and the white populace of Indianola protested for her to leave. Many said she wouldn't seek the post again, but had a year left to finish her current outing. But this wasn't good enough for the crowd, they wanted her out now. So Minnie gave in and resigned. This is when Teddy Roosevelt found out about her treatment and wouldn't accept her resignation. Roosevelt voiced an outrage at this and demanded that mail not be delivered to Indianola until Minnie got her job back. Fearing for her safety, Minnie fled the state with her husband. They then opened the first black-owned bank in the states. We've rightfully ragged on Andrew Johnson throughout this entire iceberg, but now we can give him just a little, just the slightest bit of credit for this entry. Andrew Johnson purchased the land of Alaska, something that was mocked heavily at the time, but has proven to be worthwhile since. In the 1800s, Russia was broke, and they were fighting and losing several wars. To make some money, they looked towards selling their Alaskan land. They did this for a few reasons, beginning with the fact that it was very remote and useless, and combined with the fact that this was connected to Canada, which was owned by Britain, who they were currently fighting with, giving them major access to Russian land. The United States was very interested in the Alaskan land, and at the head of the buying debate was William Seward, the Secretary of State. After negotiations, the Alaskan land was sold to America for 7.2 million United States dollars, which equated to less than 2 cents per acre. At this time, the purchase was mocked, being called Seward's Folly and Johnson's Polar Bear Garden, but the opinions on the Alaskan purchase was about to shift rapidly. Just 30 years later, gold was discovered in Alaska, and a new major gold rush began. Also, massive deposits of oil were found that were still being tapped to this day. In fact, a quarter of America's oil comes from Alaska alone. Did you know the first seven presidents weren't born in America? That's the truth, but it's kind of misleading. The first seven were born on the North American continent, but this was before they declared independence, making them the United States of America. The first president to be born in the American country was the eighth, Martin Van Buren. He's also the first president to speak English as a second language, with Dutch being his first. While he spent his time in office, Jimmy Carter was a big advocate for renewable energy, stating we could harness the power of the sun to end our crippling dependence on renewable energy, and we listened to him, and now our world is powered with solar, wind, and nuclear energy. Well, that's what would have happened if Ronald Reagan wasn't elected. During Carter's State of the Union in 1979, he made a bold pledge to have 20% of the United States power come from renewable resources by the year 2000. Later in June, solar panels were installed on the roof of the White House after Carter advocated for them for years. Some 32 of them were installed, and it cost $28,000 to do so. They were very primitive, and were only used to heat the White House's water. The panels lasted for seven years, up until Reagan's presidency, but they weren't lasting any longer, as Ronald Reagan had them tore down. There really wasn't a reason for their teardown, but people speculate about the reason. 
You see, previously, Jimmy Carter had offered tax credits to families installing solar panels, and Reagan ended this. Months later, the solar panels were torn down. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the safety of the president was top priority as fears of an assassination attempt were at an all-time high. So the Secret Service began to plan on how the president could be safely transported from place to place. They didn't have neither the time or the technology to make a car capable of keeping the president safe, but they didn't need to. They already had one. Ten years earlier, the infamous gangster Al Capone was arrested, and all of his assets were seized by the federal government, including a black and green 1928 Cadillac sedan with 3,000 pounds of bulletproof armor and bulletproof tires. The car also had sirens and a police scanner built into it, and it worked great and it got FDR to where he needed to go. Not only is Franklin Pierce one of the worst presidents, he's also the president with the worst life. He lived for 64 years and never saw a second of happiness in these 64 years. Franklin Pierce's awful life begins when he had two sons die when they were incredibly young. However, the saddest story of loss was his third son, Benjamin. When Pierce won the presidency, his family was traveling via train from their home in Concord to Washington, D.C. when the train suddenly derailed. Franklin and his wife were fine, but their son was not. Benjamin was decapitated, and Pierce tried to cover his body so his wife wouldn't see, but she saw and never forgave Franklin for this. She blamed him for this, as she wanted him out of politics for years, but he wouldn't leave. And here he was on the way to become president, now with a dead son. Then Pierce had a horrible presidency, and through all of this, he became a heavy drinker. He later died of cirrhosis, and to end his horrible life, his final words are not known because he died completely alone. After America won their war for independence, France began their own uprising known as the French Revolution. Over in America, this was viewed very favorably by some, who began to wonder if the same thing should be done to their current leaders, the Adams administration. In response, Adams, his cabinet, and the Federalist Majority Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Act, which was a set of four acts that tightened restrictions on free speech and immigration. The law raised the residency requirements to obtain citizenship from 5 to 14 years, and allowed the president to deport any immigrants during time of war. The Sedition Act made it a crime to print or discuss any false or malicious writing about the government in times of war. This was controversial. It was a major strike against the First Amendment, and was the biggest controversy of John Adams' presidency. Uh, just a quick note about Tier 10 before we get into it. My good friend Penny Pincher actually made this tier, and he has his own channel, so if you like his editing job, for sure check him out. It'll be the first link in the description. So let's get into Tier 10. When presidents are sworn into the office, they take the oath on a Bible. All 46 inaugurations followed this pattern, save for one. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president. He decided to take his oath of office by swearing on a book of law. There's no stated reason why, and it might have just been the practice at the time. There's actually no concrete evidence for what presidents swore in on. Quincy Adams just mentioned it specifically. The Chickajima incident is the story of how he almost had a president be cannibalized. On September 2nd, 1944, a group of American bombers took to the skies. Their mission was to take over a place called Chikajima, a tiny island 500 miles away from Japan. Now, Chikajima was heavily guarded. It had 25 personnel stationed there, along with anti-air cannons. So these pilots didn't really stand a chance. They were soon shot down, and all nine pilots went into the ocean. One pilot was saved by an American boat, but the other eight weren't so lucky. They were tortured, beaten, killed, and cannibalized. Now this wasn't revealed to the public until 2003, as the American government didn't want to admit that some of their soldiers they sent to war were eaten. As for that ninth pilot, it was the 41st President of the United States, George H.W. Bush. When President Nixon resigned and Gerald Ford became president, he immediately became controversial as he pardoned Richard Nixon for his crimes in the Watergate scandal. 
Remember, a presidential pardon absolves a criminal of their crimes. So now Nixon was innocent in a court of law of all Watergate involvement. This was one month into his temporary term, and he made the decision to push the nation past the controversy in an attempt to move on, also claiming that a drawn-out court case would further polarize the nation. This was a controversial decision and is likely the reason he lost re-election. What do you think? Did Gerald Ford make the right decision? Following the American Revolution, the states were consumed by debt, and the nation's new Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton, proposed that the federal government would assume the state's debts and pay it off to build a stronger union. One of the ways the federal government decided to fund this debt was a tax on whiskey, and so, the first ever revenue tax was implemented. The whiskey makers were upset about this, so widespread protests broke out across New York and Pennsylvania. When tax collectors would show up to collect, the locals would tar and feather them, and on one instance, their house was burnt down. A month later, Washington sent a letter demanding the crowd to disperse, but this letter was ignored. So Washington then sent 13,000 soldiers to break it up, and no shots were fired. The crowd dispersed, and a couple rebels were arrested, but were later pardoned by Washington. The Whiskey Rebellion was really the first test of the federal government and their ability to respond to a domestic threat. Washington's opposing political party, led by Thomas Jefferson, called him out for an overstep of the federal government, claiming it was the next step to absolute power. On May 9, 1970, several students were protesting at the Lincoln Memorial against Richard Nixon's expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. Nixon woke up at 4 in the morning and saw this massive gathering of people and decided to go down and talk to them. He spoke to a lot of the protesters and was kind of just ranting and raving like a madman, which was typical of Nixon. He encouraged the people there to travel the world while they were young, and he discussed their university's football teams. But no one was there for small talk. They were mad and were expressing their anger to the president, causing the Secret Service to worry about the president's safety. So Nixon soon left, not before a massive, hairy man ran towards Nixon and asked for a photograph to which he obliged. Bob Mustax was the so-called hairy man, and later claimed to be high on LSD during this encounter. In fact, he was so high, he thought he hallucinated the entire meeting. Some of the students were interviewed later about their talks with the president and claimed he had absolutely no sentence structure when he spoke. Andrew Johnson was regarded as one of the worst presidents we've ever had. He handled Reconstruction poorly and was incredibly lenient to the Confederate States post-Civil War. He also was even impeached, the first president to be so. During his impeachment trial, Andrew Johnson locked himself away in the Oval Office, where he found a family of white mice living. This was now his focus. Every night, he would leave out flour and water for the mice to eat. He'd watch them play and eat, and refer to him in writing as his little fellows. Andrew Johnson is one of the few presidents to not have an official pet, and these were kind of the closest things to one he had. Ah, campaigning. We love to laugh at the dumb ads, and we get annoyed at all the signs we see in people's yards. Political campaigning has a long and rich history with America, and one of the first major campaigns was that of William Henry Harrison and John Tyler in 1840. William Henry Harrison was an old man, and he held the record for the oldest president until Ronald Reagan was elected 140 years later. Like we said, he was mocked for his age, and he was dismissed as a log cabin president, someone who was born and raised in a log cabin. So William Henry Harrison embraced this, and he began to use log cabin imagery in his campaigning. He also used the slogan of Tippecanoe and Tyler too, because Harrison was nicknamed Old Tippecanoe because he participated in the Battle of Tippecanoe, something coming up later, I think. All of this effort just to win and die a month later, and then have the worst president run the country. Have you ever wondered why the hell Gerald Ford said this bizarre sentence? I'm Gerald Ford, and you're not. I did, so I dug into it. This is Gerald Ford, and this is Chevy Chase, pretending to be Gerald Ford for SNL. This is the first instance of a president being mocked on SNL, and Gerald Ford loved it. Now, Chase is famous for many reasons, but one of them is his catchphrase, I'm Chevy Chase and you're not. So at a White House dinner, Gerald Ford reminded him, I'm Gerald Ford and you're not.
In the 1930s, America was almost taken over by a cabal of billionaires. The year was 1934, and the Great Depression was in full swing. President FDR implemented the New Deal, a set of socialist policies that helped pull the country out of ruin. Now this didn't fly with the wealthy elite of the nation, as it was cutting into their profits. The final nail in the coffin for them was the removal of the gold standard, which backed the United States dollar by gold bullion. This made the wealthy elite so upset, they tried to fund an army of 500,000 ex-soldiers to launch a coup against Roosevelt. This was much more than the United States had in active personnel at the time, so it could have been a swift takeover. They brought this plan up with Smedley Butler, a former United States general. However, Butler was a devout supporter of FDR, so he turned the wealthy conspirators into the FBI and the plan was stopped. On November 6th, 1998, Bill Clinton made history when he sent the first email as a president. The email in question was sent to John Glenn, an astronaut who is currently in space, wishing him luck, and planning a meet with him once he got back. But this may not have been the first email he sent, as he sent an earlier one to the Prime Minister of Sweden, thanking him for backing Clinton's decision to lift his trade embargo on Vietnam. This email was typed in all caps and was signed by Bill Clinton, but it's not known if he was actually in the room when it was sent. The one sent to John Glenn was definitely sent by him. Ah, North Korea, the nation that threatens to blow everyone up and then have their missiles splashed into the ocean. You sure showed Poseidon. If Richard Nixon had his way with North Korea, we would have never had to have worried about them. Nixon was a fierce anti-communist, and a communist nation, North Korea, just shot down one of the spy planes over the Sea of Japan. Nixon reached out to a United States Air Force pilot stationed in South Korea and ordered him to get in his plane and drop a nuke on North Korea. Now this man, Bruce Charles, was conflicted. He didn't want to do it, but this was the president. This was his commander-in-chief. This was his boss's boss's boss. This is like Elon Musk going to one of his janitors and ordering him to blow up a state capitol. But luckily, a standout order was given, and Nixon was a sly slosh. It was kind of lashing out in a drunken anger. It's also speculated that Nixon wanted this nuke threat to be known, so that communist nations would back down from provoking the United States. If John Tyler didn't ruin his reputation enough while being president, he sunk it even further when he left the office. He left on March 4th, 1845, and returned home to Virginia where he lived a peaceful life. 16 years later, the Confederate States of America broke away, and the Civil War began. And Tyler's state of Virginia was one of these states. John Tyler was a massive supporter of slavery and succession, so he went along with the plans. He even took it a step further, when in November of 1861, he was elected to the Confederate Congress, where he served for a year before passing away. His final words were perhaps at his best, and he hit the nail on the head with that one. No one in Washington cared, and he is the only president to be buried under another nation's flag, the Confederate States of America. Tyler wanted a simple funeral, but President Jefferson Davis demanded a grand showing for political means, puppeting him as a political hero. When you're president for 12 years, lead a nation through their worst financial crisis, the most devastating war the world has seen, including an attack on American soil, and whatever else pops up, you're gonna be stressed. And this is exactly the life Franklin Roosevelt lived. To help the stress, he collected stamps, and he did this his entire life. He began collecting stamps as a kid, and it helped him through his polio, as it was a hobby that occupied his mind, but did not require physical effort to do so. He collected nearly a million stamps through his entire life, and he designed over 200 during his terms. When the Great Depression began, photos of him collecting stamps were sent around the country to help alleviate the minds of Americans worrying about the nation. If the president wasn't worried, they shouldn't be either. When Roosevelt passed away, his stamps were appraised for $80,000, $1.3 million today. But they were sold for a much higher figure than that, as it was a part of a charity auction, and this money was donated. Before he was a president, Gerald Ford had an amazing career with his college football team at the University of Michigan. He played center and was named the most valuable player several times. In 1934, Michigan was going to play Georgia Tech, 
who had a segregated team and Michigan did not. Michigan had a player named Willis Ward and he was friends with Gerald. Unfortunately, Mission had Ward set out to fit in with Georgia. Gerald threatened to set out the game himself because of this and Willis told him to play, so Gerald did. After one of Georgia's linebackers hurled a bunch of racist taunts at Gerald, the future president hit him so hard he had to be taken to a hospital on a stretcher. He told Ward that one was for him. Ward's career continued and two NFL teams even reached out for him to play, the Green Bay Packers and the Detroit Lions. But Ford refused to join as he wanted to go to law school. After Ronald Reagan's assassination attempt, Nancy Reagan sought the help of Joan Quigley, an astronomer, to help keep her husband safe. Joan said she knew about his attempt before it happened, and this convinced Nancy to bring her in. Joan then began to make calendars of color-coded days for Reagan. Red days meant he should stay inside, yellow meant be cautious, and green were safe days. Nancy would get angry if Ronald's aides would make changes to his schedule without talking to Joan first. This was kept from the media, obviously, and wasn't revealed until Reagan's former chief of staff revealed it in the late 80s. I've mentioned James Garfield a handful of times throughout the iceberg, and I'm sure every time I have, you probably hear that name Garfield, and of course you're going to think of Garfield the Cat. And I'm here to tell you, there's a connection between the two. Jim Davis is the creator of Garfield, and he named the cat after his grandfather, who was named after President James Garfield. I can't find a reason why the grandfather was named after the president, and I guess it's not 100% confirmed he was, but his name is James Garfield Davis. Come on, guys. Two days after she was born, why did I yell that? Two days after she was born, Alice Roosevelt's mom passed away, and on that same day, her grandma passed away. And her dad wrote in his journal, the light of my life has gone out. This was the start of Alice Roosevelt's crazy life, being the daughter of Teddy Roosevelt. Alice had a life of rebellion, breaking many social norms typical of a woman in that time. She smoked in the White House, and Teddy caught her saying, no daughter of mine is going to smoke under my roof. So she then went and smoked on top of the White House roof. She also walked around with a pet snake she named Emily Spinach, a queen. I love snakes. And all of this caused Teddy to say, I can either run the country or tend to Alice. I cannot possibly do both. Sorry to ruin the fun at the end, but she also supported Mustache Man in World War II, stating she would rather vote for him than Roosevelt for a third term. So, not very good of her. Did you know the teddy bear was named after President Teddy Roosevelt? Okay, you might have. But did you know that William Taft tried to compete with the teddy bear using his own animal? After Teddy Roosevelt left the office, toy companies were afraid that his absence would affect the sales of teddy bears. So they looked towards the new president, William Taft, to be the new face of their new toy, the Billy Possum. A stuffed possum toy. A campaign ad was launched focusing on the possum replacing the bear. And did it work? Well, have you ever had a stuffed possum? I doubt it, because in under a year, the Billy Possum was recalled and the teddy bear remains on top. And here we are, part two done. Next week, we're covering tiers 11 to 15, the very bottom of the iceberg. The most obscure and unknown story. So if you want to hear about how Thomas Jefferson saw a UFO, the conspiracy surrounding a mysterious presidential death, JFK's secret male lover, Nixon's career as a rapper, and the most disgusting story on the iceberg, subscribe, turn on all notifications, check out my Discord and Twitter linked in my description, and come back next Saturday.